Amen, church. He is good. Go ahead and turn your Bibles to John chapter 4. John chapter 4, we're going to look and start at verse 39. While you're turning there, let me pray for us. God, you are good. And you are sovereign. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And you are to be praised. And I pray that's what we do this morning. And not only this morning, but every day of our life. That we will sing the word of God and hear the word of God. And the Holy Spirit will apply the word of God to our life. So God, help us to glorify you and glorify your name. I pray for the Holy Spirit to lead me this morning that I may preach faithfully, that I may preach uh, the text in the way that the Holy Spirit inspired the Word of God to be taught and preached. And Father, I pray that you'll help me and you'll be glorified. Help my people to hear. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right question that I proposed to you this morning is this, if God was here in the flesh, if God was here in the flesh, what would your response to him be? I hear people often say to me, well, pastor, I can't wait to meet Jesus. I've got a few questions for him. And uh, that shocks me <laughs> um, because um, I don't think we have the right to question him. I don't think that we deserve to question him, as he is an all-knowing, all-wise, and sovereign God who created all things. But some people, that's their response to when they see Jesus, they say they're going to question him. If Jesus was here right now, um, what would your response to him be? Would you ask him questions? Would you worship him? Would you ask him for healing? Would you ask him for prosperity? Would you ask him for a miracle? What would it be? Well, you say, Pastor, how do I know that? Well, it's probably evident in your prayer life now as you talk to Jesus, hopefully daily. How do you talk to Him and pray to Him? Do you go before Him entitled, asking questions? Go before Him demanding healing? Demanding a miracle? Demanding a sign? Or do you come before Him to worship Him and to glorify His name as He is the Sovereign Lord? You see, people come and view Jesus differently, don't they? Some view Him as a great teacher. Some view Him as a miracle worker. Some view Him as a prophet. Some view Him as Lord. How do you view Him? We see here in John's Gospel that people are viewing Jesus differently, right? At the beginning of John's Gospel, we see that John the Baptist viewed Jesus as the one, the long-awaited Messiah, the Christ. We see that Nicodemus viewed Jesus as what? A rabbi and a teacher. We see other people viewing Jesus as a prophet. And some view Him as Christ. How do you view Him? Is He a good therapist to you? Is he just a really good therapist? Is he just a buddy? He's my buddy. When I have a bad day, I, I just I pray to my buddy. Is that who he is to you? You see, the fact is, every one of us view him a certain way. Biblically, we are to view him as the sovereign Lord, creator and sustainer of the universe and Redeemer of the Bride of Christ. That's how we're supposed to view Him. And so I want you to see here just some different ways that people view Jesus um, as we read through John's Gospel. John chapter 4, we're going to start with verse 39. Many Samaritans, and you heard Pastor Keith preach this last week about the woman at the well. Many Samaritans from the town believed in Him because of the woman's testimony. Listen to this. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them. So the Samaritans asked Jesus to stay. And he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. And I love this. 
They said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know, I love this, we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. So the people are not just believing because of what the woman said. These people know that he's the Savior. So after two days, he stayed there. After two days, he departed from Galilee, for Jesus himself had testified that a prophet has no honor in his hometown. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him, having seen all that he has done in Jerusalem at the feast, for they too had gone to the feast. Well, so now the Samaritans, um, he, he was with the Samaritans for a couple of days, and they wanted him to stay because they knew he was the Lord, but he left, and now he's gone to the place where he did his first miracle, right, um, at the feast, and they welcomed him. Now, why were they welcoming Jesus? Because he turned water to wine. Because he was a miracle worker. And if you had a lot of sick people that you wanted healed, who would you welcome? The miracle worker. Right? And so they're, they're welcoming him. But you see, it's kind of odd that they put in verse 44, John put, For Jesus himself had testified that a prophet has no honor in his hometown. So why would Jesus continue to go back to a place that he's not getting honor. So Samaritans loved him, continues to go back to a place he's not getting honor. Why would he do this? Well, because there, something I need you to grab from, from this introduction is this, that God has a sovereign plan for everything. He has a sovereign plan. Look at chapter 5, verse 18. This was why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father and making himself equal with God. Why does Jesus keep putting himself where people would hate him? He intends to keep offering himself to his own, and overall, his own will not receive him. This will, in the end, get him killed, which is why Jesus came, which is to die for the bride. This is important for us to understand. People viewed Jesus differently, and Jesus kept putting himself in hostile situations, claiming to be God. Claiming to be God. Some people accepted him as God, equal with God. Other people rejected him and sought to kill him. But he sovereignly kept placing himself there, because one day, he's come, he's going, what's going to happen is what he came and he came to do, which is to be crucified for the bride of Christ. This is why this is so important. And so we get now to two stories with that in mind. We see people viewing Jesus differently. We see God's sovereign plan unfolding as he keeps putting himself in these places and around these people. And now we get to these two stories, which are the second and third signs of Christ throughout John's gospel. I want you to look at now at verse 46. We get to the first story, the second sign. So he came again to Cana in Galilee, where he had made the water wine. So he came again to Cana in Galilee, where he made the water wine. And at Capernaum, there was an official whose son was ill. When this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea, to Galilee, he went to him and asked him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. And so let, let's put ourselves there. Jesus um, ha, has came now to the place where people knew him as a miracle worker, and this official heard about it, and he comes up to Jesus, and he asked Jesus to heal his son, and it's a pretty fair thing to do, isn't it? Wouldn't you? Right? There's no more stressful time right, in a parent's life than when your son or daughter's sick. Is there? Like, there's nothing more stressful than that. And this official, he knows and hears about Jesus, and he comes to Jesus asking for his son to be healed, and this is a fair thing to do. We as believers look at this story, and we go, well, of course he did. We know that only God can heal the sick. We know that only God can heal the lame and the blind and the paralyzed. 
We know that only God can redeem, even the Jew and Gentile and Samaritan. We know that God is sovereign. We know that God is the creator and sustainer of the world. So, of course, you go to God. But we are coming to God a little bit differently than this official. This official is coming to to Jesus as only a miracle worker, not as the Savior of the world. And so he comes to Jesus expecting the miracle worker to perform a miracle. That's why he comes to him. And he says... He had heard Jesus, and he came to Judea to Galilee. He went to him and asked him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. How does Jesus respond? So Jesus said to him in verse 48, Unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. You see, like the Galileans as a whole, he, this official, did not see Jesus as the Christ. He didn't see Jesus as the Christ but centered around only, his view of Jesus centered around only his miraculous signs. The people became enamored with signs and miracles, but did not see Jesus as the long-awaited Messiah. This is what Jesus is saying, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. You're not seeing me as the Savior of the world, long-awaited Messiah. You see, these people in Galilee, just like this official, they were sign-seekers. They were people seeking miracles, not seeking a Savior. Now, I don't want you to hear me wrong, church family. I'm not saying that we should not um, ask God for miracles and we shouldn't ask God for healing. I'm not saying that these miracles are a negative thing. Um, But these miracles here that Jesus is doing in the context of John chapter 4 is to show us that He is the Christ not just some miracle worker. You say, well, how, how do you know that, Pastor? How do you know that? Go ahead and turn to John chapter 20. John 20. Look at verse 30 and 31. Listen to what the, what the, past, what the Word of God says. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of His disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written. What, what's written? Signs and miracles. So that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. So why is Jesus showing the signs and the miracles? Why? Why was He doing those? Was it because He wanted us to have our best life on earth? Was it because if we have enough faith, then God will heal us and we'll have a prosperous life on earth? Is that why Jesus is doing the miracles? No. Why is he doing the miracles? To show that he's the Christ. And this is what's going on right now with this official. This official is saying, heal my son. I'm coming to you as a miracle worker. And Jesus is saying, but you're missing I'm the Christ. You're missing that I'm the Christ. You're missing that I'm the long-awaited Messiah. That's who I am. They were sign seekers and not savior seekers. And I have to ask the question this morning, who, which are you? Which are you? How do you come to Jesus? How do you view Jesus? Are you just some person seeking uh, God to prosper your life? Is he just a means to a better life, a means to an end? Who is he? Is he just someone you can pray to? And if you have enough faith, then he'll, he'll heal your son or daughter or your dad or your mom or your life. Who is he? I'm telling you, listen, being healed is not a bad thing. Asking God to heal you is not a bad thing. But is that what consumes you? Is that how you view Jesus? Because he's more than that. He's the Savior. He's the long-awaited Messiah. That's who he is. He deserves all the honor and glory and praise. Which are you? What if God never answers your request for health? What if God never answers it? Is He still good? Like He's saying, is He still breathtaking? Is He still worthy of your praise? What if, what, what if God is more concerned over your eternal life with Him rather than a prosperous life that is only here for a, a little while, a mist? that appears for a short time. What then? 
So I ask again, what if, what if, what if you have a chance to talk to Jesus? Like the official. You're asking for health? Is that what your prayer life reflects? You're asking for wealth, prosperity? For show me a miracle. I know what I'm asking. I'm bowing at his feet and begging him to redeem my kids for eternity. That's what I'm asking. And that's what my prayer life asks. I'm not begging him to, to make my kids healthy or wealthy. I'm begging him, for, begging him for their eternal life. And he knows that, because that's what I do every day. Every day. Because I view him as the Savior of the world, and I trust his sovereign plan in my short little life on this earth. Why would God keep putting Jesus in situations where people didn't honor him because he had a sovereign plan that would one day get him crucified for our benefit and his glory? He has a plan. Continue on the story. Jesus says, Unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. Verse 49, The official said to him, Sir, Come down before my child dies. Can you imagine saying that to Jesus? Could you? Like, you miracle worker, sir, come down before my child dies. I'm demanding it. And man, I get it. Like, I'm stressed out over my kids being sick, right? Like, you almost want, you go to the hospital and you're like, we need care now, doctor. And like, we're doing all we can. No, you're not. Right? Like, you ever been there? Right? Nurses is like, Parents losing their mind happens every night at Erlanger Hospital, right? Parent losing their mind right down the hall. I'm sure they have a team for that. You should, right? No offense to those parents. We're all there. We're stressed out, right? And this is where he's at, right? Sir, come down before my child dies. You don't understand the urgency. You're asking me questions. I heal my son, miracle worker. Jesus said to him, Go. Your son will live. God's sovereign choice. Your son will live. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. And I love this. I love this response. As he was going down, his servants met him and told him that his son was recovering. So he asked them the hour when he began to get better. And they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. The father knew that was the hour when Jesus had said to him, your son will live. And I love this. I love the response. And he himself believed in all his household. Why did Jesus do the miracle? So that they would be redeemed. I love the response. And they believed him and his household. I love, I love the leadership of the father here, right? He believed, and the whole household believed. That's how it should be. The father believes, loves Jesus, sells out to Jesus, and leads his family to do the same thing. I love that. But I want to ask another hard question. Did the man, the official, did he deserve the right to come to Jesus? No. Did his son deserve to be healed? No. So why was he? Why was he given the right to demand something of Jesus? Why was his son healed? Why did this man even get to approach the creator of the world? Because God is compassionate because God is loving. Because God is gracious. That's why. This man didn't deserve the right to ask anything of Jesus as a non-believer. The man's son didn't deserve to be healed as he was a depraved sinner, an enemy of God. It's hard to view that way, right? But it's true. He didn't deserve it. 
It teaches us something about salvation, doesn't it? We don't deserve to call on God, but we get to through Jesus. We don't deserve to have our prayers answered, but we, we have them answered through Jesus. We're saved through Jesus. This is the beauty of the gospel. We don't deserve God's favor. We don't deserve his grace or his redemption, but God gives it to the undeserving, and we praise him for that. Only God can do the impossible. Only God can take an impossible moment and show his glory. Only God can redeem a family from the worst conditions. Only God can do this. Only God can send a son where he does not get honor. His son's crucified, bears the wrath of God, and on the third day is risen from the grave, and it redeems his bride. Only God can do that. That's who he is. And so the first point I want you to get from this story is this. Here's the first point I want you to get from the passage. Jesus is not just a miracle worker. He's not just a genie in a bottle, right? Or a genie in a little thing. If you, if, you, if you rub him right, he'll answer your prayer. If you have enough faith, you say it the right way, you, Jesus will answer it. It's not who he is. He is the Lord. He is the creator and savior and sustainer of the world. And we should seek him, not just his signs and his miracles. We should seek him. That's why he came and showed miracles and signs, so that people would believe in him. It's very clear in John chapter 20. It's why. Not so we can just beg him for miracles all the time. Right? No, not just to see him as a miracle worker, but to see him as Lord. Now hear me, I want you to hear me say this. I'm not against praying to God for miracles. I will pray with you today. I'll pray with you today. I'm not against that. God is still in the miracle working business. That's true. But he's more than that. And if he decides not to do a miracle in your life, guess what? He's still God and we should still honor his name. He's more than just a miracle worker. He's more than just a therapist. He's more than just a person that should make our life good and, and us feel good. He's the Savior, and He's the sustainer. In reality, we don't deserve to come to Him, but in His grace, He allows us to. He is the sovereign ruler of the world. That's who He is. So, Jesus is not just a miracle worker. He is the Lord. Galileans thought He was just a miracle worker. But he's more than that. Let's look at chapter 5, the second story of a miracle. This is the third sign that Jesus shows. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there was in Jerusalem by the Sheep Gate a pool in Aramaic called Bethesda, which has five rooted colonnades. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, paralyzed. Verse 5, one man was there who had been an invalid for 38 years. Now, here's what's happening. Jesus is going up and, and, and he goes by, in his sovereign choice, he goes by this pool called um, he goes by this pool in Aramaic called Bethesda. And at this pool, there are uh, paralyzed people, there's lame people, there's sick people, and they're all laying by this pool. And so if you have a King James Version Bible, uh, you will see that verse 4 says that in this pool, um, that an angel would come down and, and stir up the waters. And, and when the angel stirred up the waters, if you got in, you would be healed. Well, if you have an ESV or an NASB uh, Bible, you see that there is no verse 4. Verse 4 is not there. Okay? And now I was like, oh my, I've never realized that. Okay? And so verse 4 is not there. Why is verse 4 not there? Well, I won't explain this as we get into the story. Verse 4 is not there because when the King James was written, um, they only had a certain amount of manuscripts. Okay, since then, we have found the Dead Sea Scrolls, we have found older manuscripts, we have found a lot of different things, and in the older manuscripts, it doesn't say that. It doesn't say that an angel came down and stirred up the waters. So if you look at verse 7, um, it talks about when the water is stirring up, that if someone got in, and so in the 
manuscripts that was written after that, somebody went back and added in that an angel would come down and stir that up. Here's what I'm going to tell you. I don't know if an angel came down and stirred up the water. It's not the point of the story. Okay? I know that in the older manuscripts that we found, it doesn't say that in the Greek manuscripts. It doesn't say that there was an angel that came down and stirred up the water. Whatever it is, some people believe that an angel came down and stirred up the water. Some people believe that it was spring-fed with minerals, right? And when you got in, that it would heal uh, the person just because it was clean water. Whatever it is, people believed that if you got in that water, you would be healed. And on that, at that pool, uh, Bethesda, name of it, there were people laying out beside that pool. And whenever that water got to stir, whether it was a spring or whether it was an angel or whatever, they believed that if you were one of the first people in, you would be healed. And so what you have here is all these people laying by the pool. You see lame, you see sick, you see paralyzed, all these people. And one of them that was lying there was a man who was sick for 38 years. And he was laying on this little straw bed. And this is where we're at in the story. And so Jesus is walking by this pool, and he sovereignly chooses this man. He saw this man lying there and knew that he had already been there a long time. And he said to him, I love this, do you want to be healed? Yeah. Right? He's been there for 38 years. He's been sick for 38 years. Do you want to be healed? The sick man answers, sir, I have no one to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up. So when the water is stirred up, and that's where they think that verse 4, you know, got put in. People was clarifying that later on, all right? When the water is stirred up, nobody's here to put me in the pool. And while I am going another step down before me, Jesus said to him, not get in the pool, right? Not do a work. I love this. Get up, take up your bed, and walk. And at once... The man was healed, and he took up his bed and walked. Don't you love that? He took up his bed and walked. Now, what about the other people that were laying by the pool? Why did God choose him and not them? Right, isn't that the question? Why does God decide to heal some people, and not others. Why? And church, I don't don't have the answer to that. But I will say that you can trust His will, and you can trust His plan. And I don't know why. And I'm not telling you that you can't ask Him for healing. I'm not telling you, I I will definitely pray over you that God will heal and perform a miracle in your life. But if he doesn't, is he still good? Like, is he still Lord? Or because he doesn't do a miracle in your life, he's no longer good enough for you to follow? That's the question. Isn't he still good? Is he still worth following? So why did God choose this man? Continue on. The man took up his bed, verse 12, and they asked him, Who is this man uh, who said to you, Take up your bed and walk? Now the man who had been healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn as there was a crowd in the place. So this man is healed after being sick for 38 years. And I want you to look at the different responses. A crowd of people is coming, right? Because the miracle worker is doing miracles. There's also religious leaders who are questioning, how dare you get up and walk on the Sabbath? And, and does that not shock you? Does that like, like Deanna tells me that people can um, read my face and that I need to stop showing stuff on my face sometimes? Like, you know, when people say something crazy and you're just like, you know, Deanna's like, you should go. <laughs> right? I'm working on it. Right, but, but that's kind of how I feel. Like, this man has been sick, and of course some people responded, right, when he's healed, that a crowd's come, you want to see the miracle worker. But other people said this, that now this man who had been healed did not know who it was. Sorry, sorry take up your bed and walk. And they asked, who was this man who said take up your bed and walk because he's doing it on the Sabbath day? And so some people are like, how dare you get up and walk? 
I feel like at that point, Jesus, you ever seen that Lane Kiffin? What people use it on Twitter all the time where he's just like, you know, just shakes his head and looks like, you just said that? Like, I kind of feel like that right now because these people are like, you've been sick for 38 years. Some people are like, wow, he's healed. And the religious leader is like, How, why are you walking on the Sabbath? I don't know. I hadn't walked for 38 years. Right? How dare you pick up your little straw bed and walk? I can't believe you, you heretic. And I feel like that lame man's like, I'm walking to the temple. Right? Like, I'm walking to the temple. And so, again, people respond to Jesus differently. Jesus obviously did not break the Sabbath. This man did not break the Sabbath. Uh, the, the religious leaders at that time added to the Old Testament law. Nobody was breaking the Sabbath, but they were upset that this man actually would walk on the Sabbath. And again, we see different responses. So we'll continue on. Jesus removed himself. He withdrew from the crowd. Why did he withdraw from the crowd? It wasn't about him being recognized as a miracle worker. It was about him being recognized as Lord. If you see this all throughout Scripture, right? The crowds would come to Jesus. He was healing. The crowds would come. What does it say? That he would remove himself from the crowd and go to a desolate place and pray. It's all throughout Scripture. Why? Did God not care about healing all those people? Of course he, of course he cares about those people. But what he cares about is their eternal life. His plan to redeem his bride. Let's continue on. He withdrawn from the crowd. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, See, you are well. Sin no more, that nothing worse may happen to you. I love the fact that Jesus goes and finds the man. And he tells the man why he is healed. He's healed for the sake of holiness. He has told him, man, sin no more. He's healed for the sake of holiness. Go and sin no more. Some people ask, well, was it this man's sin that caused him to be sick? Was this man's sin? So people ask that question, Pastor, am I sick because of a consequence, a past mistake that I made in my life? Is that why I'm sick? Now, sin has consequences, that's true. But I want you to flip to chapter 9. John chapter 9. Listen to what the Word of God says in verse 1 through 3. John chapter 9, verses 1 through 3. As he passed by, he saw a man blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. see what this is teaching us, right? Sometimes it is just God's sovereign plan for you to be sick. And that's really hard, isn't it? And I'm not asking you um, to not pray for healing, because it may be God's plan to heal you. But I'm telling you, you can trust His plan no matter what. And the eternal life with Him, will there be no more sickness and no more pain and no more suffering, will be far greater than any health that this world will ever offer you. It will be far, far greater. So why are the second and third miracles in the Bible? Is it to show us that God is a great miracle worker that Jesus is a great person at signs? No. It's to show us that He is the long-awaited Messiah. That if you believe in Him, you will have eternal life. That's why these are here. Is God all-powerful? Yes. Is God all-wise? Yes. Is God a miracle worker? Yes. Is God the great physician? Yes. But more than that, He is the Savior and Redeemer of the world. This is what it's teaching us. The second point, he heals people for the purpose of salvation, for his glory. Number one, I told you, Jesus is not just a miracle worker, he is Lord. And if he heals you, or whether he doesn't heal you, it is for his glory. It's for his glory. And so again, 
I'm not telling you to look at calling on God for a miracle in a negative sense. I'm not telling you to do that. You should. You should cast all of your cares at His feet. But you should also trust His answer. You should trust His answer. And you should seek to glorify His name in everything. No one wants kids to be sick. No one. And I beg God to heal them. But more than that, I beg for God to redeem them for eternity. To redeem them for eternity. It's hard truth to understand, but sometimes we're praying for healing for someone who's a believer. And I don't want to fault you for this, but I need you to hear this. We're praying for, for God to heal them and to leave them in a depraved world instead of God to take them home to a place where there'll be no more suffering and no more pain. Does that not strike you as odd? That we would ask God to leave? Would, is that not a cruel thing for us to do sometime in our selfishness to ask God to leave someone here and suffer when God could take them home where there's no more suffering? Is it that our perspective is off? that we perceive this life as being great and have no understanding of how great heaven is. It's just a thought. It's a hard, hard truth that sometimes it's God's will for His glory. The boy didn't deserve to be healed, but God did. The man couldn't get into the pool on his own. And through Jesus, he didn't have to. Both received grace and redemption they did not deserve. And isn't that our story? That we receive grace and redemption we do not deserve. We, couldn't, we didn't deserve it and we can't do it on our own. That's why Jesus had to come. Because only he is sovereign only He is all-powerful. Only He is the Savior. Only He is all-wise. Only He can heal, restore, and redeem. It is Him. Only Jesus can do those things. It is Jesus who is the Messiah. It is Jesus who is all-powerful. It is Jesus who can redeem. It is Jesus. And this is why they sought to kill Him. Not because He's a miracle worker. Because why would you kill a miracle worker? Would you? Right? If you have a true miracle worker, why would you ever let him go? Right? Why wouldn't you capture him and put him in a dungeon somewhere and just bring people down there? Do a miracle, I'll give you some food. Right? Right? That's, that's the corruptness of man, right? You take the miracle worker, you hide him for your own, and you use him for the rest of his life. He's a miracle worker, so guess what? He should live forever. Right? It's always astonishing to me these people who claim to be miracle workers on the earth are wearing glasses. Is that shocking to anyone else? You cannot trust a miracle worker who wears glasses. Okay? Another point you should grab hold of this morning. All right? But why wouldn't you? You would take him. And you, they're, not, they're not seeking to kill Jesus because he's a miracle worker. You know why they're seeking to kill Jesus? Verse 18. This is why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Couldn't Scripture be that clear all the time? <laughs> right? Because not only was he breathtaking, or sorry, sorry, not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Church, that's why he's doing this. He's not just claiming to be a miracle worker, he's claiming to be the Savior and Messiah and Lord. And church, that's who we follow. The God who is all-powerful, yes. The God who does miracles, yes. The God who's healer, yes. But the God who came from heaven to earth to redeem us and did. Who redeemed us, who died on the cross, who bore the wrath of God. And on the third day, God rose him from the tomb. That's who we worship. And that's who they sought to kill. They couldn't do anything with him. He was healing people and claiming to be Christ. They weren't mad he was healing people. They were mad he was claiming to be God and making himself equal with God. Because that's what he came to proclaim. Not that he's a great miracle worker. 
that he is, but that he is Christ. So I ask again, who is he to you this morning? Who is he to you? Is he the miracle worker? You say, well, some. I believe he's a miracle worker. I believe he's a healer. But who is he? Overall, who is he to you? He can't just be a miracle worker. He can't just be a good therapist or a good buddy or someone to think about sometimes. He is the all-powerful, almighty God who created, redeemed, sustains, and um, reconciles his bride back to him. That's who he is, the redeemer and savior of the world. And that's who we worship, church. That's who we worship. In the good days and the bad, when the prayers are answered and when they're not, we glorify him because he is God and he is worthy. So I ask again, who is he to you? Who is he to you? Is he the Christ? Because here's the fact, he's either everything to you or he is nothing to you. Is he everything? Is he the Lord, Savior, and Sustainer in your life? Is he? Or is he just a good person to talk to and to ask for a miracle? It should be more than that. I want to say this again in closing. I'm not saying that it's not God's will for him to heal you if you've got something going on. If you want to pray about any sickness or your child or your family, I will pray with you. But I will pray with you trusting that what God's answer is, that him as a sovereign ruler in his wisdom, whatever his answer is, it is best. And it's not up to our faith. It's not up to us saying the right things or doing the right things to get him to answer our prayer. It's up to his sovereign will. And we can trust that. All right? So I'll pray with you. I'll, I'll do anything I can to reach out to God because he is a good God that allows us to come to him. But he's more than just a miracle worker. He's the Savior. Let's pray. God, we thank you for being such a good Savior and Lord. I'm thankful um, that you are a miracle worker. I think about someone, a pastor like Matt Chandler, who was sick and had cancer, and you decided to heal him. And so you did. I remember men coming around Matt Chandler and praying for him, and that you did a miracle, and you healed him. And you healed him for his holiness and your glory. And that's what Matt Chandler's done. He has went out and he has proclaimed your glory and told what you've done in his life. And he is telling people about a redeeming Savior named Jesus. And I'm thankful for those times. But whether that is the story of the people in this room or whether it's not of healing, I pray that they still see you as the Savior and sustainer. Because while you may not offer them health in this world, you are offering them uh, a life with you where there is no more suffering and no more pain. You are offering them eternal life through Jesus where their sins are forgiven and they are part of the family of God. And Father, that is far greater. Eternal life with you is far greater than health in this world. And God, help us to remember that. And so Father, we're about to sing a song of what a day that'll be. And what a day that'll be when we are with you praising you with no more sickness and no more pain and no more suffering. No more burdens. Just being with you. And we long for that day. And so, Father, I pray for the people. May they see you as Christ. May they look to you. And may they trust your sovereign plan. God, there's some in this room that, that have sickness and we ask for their healing. I know many in this room that I've prayed for often. And even this morning, I pray for your healing hand to be upon them. And I pray that you'll use their life as an instrument of usefulness for your glory. But whether you heal them or not, Father, I'm going to trust your wisdom and your plan. And I pray that they will too. And we long await to be with you as you've prepared us a place in heaven. So, so Father, we praise you Thank you for salvation. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.